And there are certain teams, certain contenders, that, in my opinion, are in a near desperate position with regard to their rotation. Welcome everyone to the Monday edition of Fair Territory. We have a lot to unpack on this Monday. A lot happened on this weekend from the Hall of Fame inductions to a dramatic series in LA between the Dodgers and Red Sox. A lot going on in the sport, some injuries that we're going to need to discuss. Just the usual blizzard at this time of year. Oh, well, blizzard's probably the wrong word considering the heat all over the country, but you know what I'm getting at. It's trade deadline time. It's time to get into a lot of stuff. I want to start today with the Dodgers, and not just because they swept the Red Sox, just because they remain one of the game's most fascinating teams coming off that billion-dollar offseason season. We've seen that they're not exactly perfect, but they were better against the Red Sox. They swept them, completed the sweep yesterday with a 9-6 victory, which they hit a bunch of home runs. They are a team that still has a lot of questions. Now, what did we see yesterday? Otani with the 473-foot homer, his 30th of the season. That was the second longest at Dodger Stadium of the StatCast era. It wasn't even the longest of the day. Jorge Soler went 478 at Coors Field, but Otani continues to be their biggest star by far. Now, they have an eight-game lead, second biggest lead only to the Phillies, who lead the NL East by eight and a half. Dodgers' playoff odds are 99%, and yet, as I mentioned, there are still questions here, and it starts with the rotation. It starts with the rotation that will get Clayton Kershaw and... Tyler Glass now back this week, but is still missing Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Walker Bueller, still questions with Bobby Miller, with James Paxton, and others as well. Gavin Stone has been their most consistent starter. Gavin Stone. It's kind of amazing if you think about it. And yet, that is where they are. Now, they played badly heading into the break. They had lost 2 of 3 to Detroit, 10 of 15 overall. They did better this weekend, but again, there are things here you look at you're just not sure about. The rotation is just one of them. The middle infield. Now, this is a developing story as well. Mookie's out for a couple of more weeks with that hand thing. Gavin Lux, who has been struggling the entire season, last two days, five for six, two homers, two doubles, finally showing that maybe he can be an answer. He's played great defense all year. He is every day, one day more removed from his knee surgery that took him out of the 2023 season. So maybe, based on the last two days, five for six, two homers, two doubles, he can be an answer. Miguel Rojas, who is the other option in the middle infield when Betts returns, he left yesterday's game with right forearm tightness. So it remains to be seen if they'll add at the deadline. They're going to be looking for starting pitching first and foremost, but also a middle infielder if they can get one. How do they go about this? They also want an outfield. Their bullpen's getting healthier. We saw Joe Kelly come back this weekend. Gratterall is on his way back. Michael Grove is on his way back. And then they'll be followed by Brazier. Evan Phillips is struggling. That's a concern for sure. But the bullpen seems to be settling in. So this is going to be, as it has been all season long and going back to the offseason, a team to watch, a team that has a ton of pressure on it because of the money that has been committed to this roster. A roster that for all that has been spent remains incomplete. Now, I mentioned injuries at the top of the show. We had some big ones yesterday, unfortunately, for the teams involved, for the players involved. You just hate to see this, and it seems like it's every day in baseball, right? Julio Rodriguez slams into the wall, hurts his ankle. X-rays were negative, and that's good. It seems like he might be okay, but he's going for an MRI. You just never know. There's the play right there. You can see his left foot got caught in the wall. Julio is obviously a huge part of what they do offensively, and what they do offensively is not much. This is a team that incredibly ranks 28th in the majors in runs scored. 28th ahead of only the Marlins and White Sox, two of the worst teams we've seen in, I would say, some time, the White Sox in particular. So that's where the Mariners are offensively. We know if Julio is healthy, they need to make a big move. The Astros have caught them after a 7-19 and start. That's incredible. One of the more incredible developments of this season. 
The other series of injuries, and it was a series of injuries, took place with the Atlanta Braves. Max Fried sidelined with left forearm neuritis. Then Ozzy Albies, and this was really rough. You see this play. He suffered a fractured left wrist. He'll be out eight weeks, and that will take him to the end of the season pretty much before he can return. And with hand injuries, wrist injuries, we know those can be awfully tricky for hitters. And even when they come back, they're not always right. So we've seen this with so many hitters over the years. Most recently, Tommy Edmond is yet to play this season with his hand wrist issue and now Albies. The Braves on Monday did sign Whit Merrifield to a major league deal. This was a move that you could have seen coming once Albies went on the injured list. But at the same time, Whit Merrifield with the Phillies was not a productive offensive player. Now maybe he'll find it with the Braves. He's going to play much more regularly, I would assume, and that is good news for him. But Let's take a look at the Braves, the primary Braves, who are on the injured list right now because this is a staggering list of talent and actually financial investments as well. Acuna Jr., we haven't seen him for much of the year. Albies, now on the IL. Freed, now on the IL. Michael Harris the second. He's supposedly coming back, and he should be back fairly soon. And, of course, Spencer Strider as well. 11 players total on the injured list. That's not an unusual number for teams in this particular season, an injury mart season for so many, but it is a big number. And for the Braves, the quality of player that they have lost is absolutely staggering. Now, let's look at the big picture, though. The Braves are still the team holding the top National League wildcard spot. They've got a four-game lead over the wildcard outsiders. They're in pretty good shape. Their playoff odds are something like 90%. So if you're Alex Anthopoulos, their president of baseball operations, what do you do? Well, you signed Whit Merrifield to be ostensibly an Albies replacement. Okay, that's a start. They were looking and have been looking for an outfielder going back to really early July. They know they need to add there. And I still believe they might need and probably will need a starting pitcher. That need increases with the loss of Freed. They claim or they say it's not serious or it doesn't appear serious. When you see any forearm issue, it's a red flag. That is often forearm problems, a precursor to a major elbow issue. So the Braves are sitting there. They're in good shape, but they're only in good shape from the standings. They're not in good shape physically. Which brings us to our final item in the lead of this particular program today, and that is the National League wildcard standings. Let's take a look and let's see where the Braves are relative to other teams and we'll get into this a little bit because this is, again, the most fascinating race we have going on in baseball. Okay, you see it. The Braves lead by four games. The Cardinals are next two and a half games behind the Braves with the second wild card spot. Then a three team tie for the third wild card spot right now. It's between the Mets, the Diamondbacks, and the Padres. Those three teams tied for the third spot. Now, trailing these teams are some other clubs that are kind of sitting on the buy-sell fence. Here are the Pirates. They're a half game out, playoff odds of about 21%. I believe they should buy, but they're not going to go crazy, obviously, with that kind of situation that they're facing. But they should be looking to add pieces that can help them, obviously, in 2024, but mostly in 2025 and beyond. The Giants, this is an interesting team. They've spent all that money. They sacrificed draft picks for Snell, for Chapman, and yet they're sitting there three games back in the wild card race. The Cubs, we wrote about them today in the Athletics Trade Deadline Watch. They are tilting towards selling. There's no question about that. They are not going to be aggressive buyers. The Cincinnati Reds, they've invested a lot in this season too relative to their market size, and they are fading fast. 3.6% playoff odds. And the Nationals, We've already seen them start to sell with the Hunter Harvey trade, and they will continue that. If they're smart, they trade not just their expiring contract players. Dylan Floro is one of them, but they also trade some of the guys under an extra year of control. Lane Thomas and their closer, their all-star closer, last-minute all-star, Kyle Finnegan. So you see the NL wildcard race. It is, as I've called it, a mass of mediocrity, and yet... It's interesting, and these teams, eight days until the deadline, well, we're going to see some interesting decisions made, we're going to see some deals, and we're going to see some action.
Time now for the inside dish, the part of the show where I talk about a story I've written, maybe a trend in the game, maybe something else that has popped into my feeble mind. But this week, I will talk about a story I've written, the one that was published today about the relationship between Shohei Otani, his former interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, and his agent, Nez Bolello. Now, when I write for The Athletic, generally, 95% of the ideas are mine. I kind of just go along and do what I've done. I've done this a long time. By now, I should kind of know what to do. That said, you're always open to ideas, and you're always taking ideas and discussing things with writers, with editors. And this idea actually came from inside The Athletic, from our main baseball editor, Mark Carrig. Now, Andy McCullough, one of our writers, might also take credit. I don't know the exact particulars, but Carrig came to me about three months ago, right after this situation broke with Ipe Mizuhara. This was mid-April, and he said, listen, what no one knows here is this relationship between these three guys, how it could have led to what has happened, how the only plausible way what happens could have happened was because of this relationship being so insular. So I began working on that story and talking to different people. And the goal was to show how this relationship worked and just kind of the unusual dynamic between these three guys. Now, it was a tough nut to crack in part because none of the principals would talk. Secrecy is a big part of the Otani world, as we've come to learn. And this is a situation where you had to talk to others. So I went to others, more than 25 people. It might have been even more than 30. We used 25 in the story, but I lost count after a while. People with the Dodgers, players, coaches, others, people who knew Otani from the Angels, Japanese media, an expert on Japanese culture, all of these people we kind of just kept going to and asking questions about and trying to gain a better understanding of what was going on. Now, as I said, this was a three-month process, and it came to the point where you stop gathering and you have to write. And after Jason Stark was inducted into the National Sports Media Hall of Fame in Charlotte, this was in late June, I had to go to Atlanta, and that was my next game for Fox. And I went to a hotel room in Atlanta, a hotel in Atlanta, and sat in a room for two days just writing over the July 4th holiday, actually. And from there, we went through the editing process, which at The Athletic, especially since being owned by The New York Times, is kind of exhaustive. Actually, it was exhaustive even before we were owned by The New York Times. There were a lot of eyes on this story. And our main editor on these kinds of things, these longer pieces, is someone named Emma Spann. And Emma who I've worked with since I started at The Athletic, she's one of the best editors I've ever had. Okay, so about the story. One of the frustrating things about this whole situation is we don't know exactly what went on. We know what the government told us, and we've all wondered if there is more to it. Now, the government story, the government complaint, was pretty direct and pretty clear. But again, I set out to find out a little bit more. Now, there's nothing in this story that I would qualify or label as a bombshell detail. There's some interesting stuff, but it's nothing that is going to cause aggregators across the country to write stories off of this one. At least I don't think that's the case. So you ask, okay, what does this story accomplish? Well, of course, that's for the reader to decide, and I'm not quite sure. But I do believe that we give a fuller portrait of that relationship that took place between these three. Now, of course, Mizuhara was fired, then he was sentenced to bank and tax fraud, so he is out of the picture. And the Dodgers have hired someone else from their organization, Will Ireton, to replace him as Otani's main interpreter. Now, again, I spoke to that frustration of wanting to know more. We all want to know more here. It's such a mysterious kind of thing. And I don't know that we'll ever know the full story, and people investigative reporters have tried to attack this and get more than the government told us about what happened, even though the government's account was incredibly and richly detailed. There have been reporters working on this and trying to find out more, trying to find out if there are significant details that maybe we're missing in what the government said. But to this point, no one has come up with anything of any significance on that. We've seen some minor stories come out, but nothing has really broken to explain if indeed there was something more here. So we can only go on what we have. And this story was based, obviously, 
on what we have. Again, what did I accomplish? That's for you guys to decide. You might think the story's dumb. You might think it's kind of interesting. You might think, wow, I didn't know a lot of this kind of thing. Okay, whatever the case might be. Whenever I write, even when it's just a trade story, even when it's a notes column, whatever the case might be, or a longer feature like this one, my goal is always the same. It's to tell the reader at least one thing that he or she didn't know, and it's to make people think. I do believe this story will make people think. It will make people wonder about this relationship between these three guys even more. And maybe, and this is my great hope, people can understand after reading this that what happened was the product of these relationships, that it only could have happened because of this incredible trust between these three and a distrust of anyone who was not part of their group. So that's the story behind the story. Hope you enjoy it and we'll see what the next one brings. We'll be back after a quick word from Scott Braun and Eric Kratz. Kratz here from FT. I wasn't feeling as focused as I wanted to be and heard some buzz about AG1. Since drinking AG1 daily, I felt energized, locked in and ready to hit the day. Braun here, that's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a better, smarter way to elevate your baseline health. Kratz, not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. That's a big deal for me. I recommend AG1 to fam and friends because it's tested for 950 contaminants and NSF certified for sport. Kratz, we're both traveling a lot too, and those travel packs are clutch. I drink AG1 daily to support gut health so that we can dominate the day. So if there's one product to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1, and that's why we're excited to welcome them as a new partner to the FT Network. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash foul. That's drinkag1.com slash foul. Go check it out. Time now for Grilling Ken. Let's get to your questions. The first question comes from Josh who asks, does Luis Robert get traded and do the Sox get somewhere close to the Soto level asking price? They're asking if he does. No, they're not getting Soto level price for... Luis Robert. One, because he is not Juan Soto. That's the main reason right there. And I don't know, honestly, that he gets traded at all, Josh. And here's the problem with Robert. It's not that he's too expensive. His contract actually is quite fair if he is on the field. It's $12.5 million this year, which you'd pay the rest of. $15 million next year, and then a pair of club options at $20 million each. Those are affordable prices for a player of this ability level. Problem, as we've discussed, is he doesn't stay on the field. And since coming back, he's been okay. He hasn't been great. Came back June 4th from his latest injury. He's batting since then 229 with a 315 on base percentage. Not very good. He has a 780 OPS, which is above league average, but really only because he has hit nine home runs. I'm not discounting the nine home runs, but this is not a player who is suddenly turning into an on base machine after his injury. So, here are the White Sox. They've got all of these different pieces to trade, Crochet and Fetty and Pham. And yet with Luis Robert Jr., they might find that teams aren't as motivated as perhaps they will be if Robert plays the rest of the season and at that point puts up better numbers. Teams probably want to see more before they make a big commitment and they're never going to get to the Soto level commitment. He was a healthy player, a younger player at the time and a better player. So if I had to guess right now, my odds of Luis Robert Jr. getting traded would be about 40%. I'm not saying it won't happen, and that's just an estimate. But it's going to take a lot for it to happen, and I'm just not sure any team will be motivated enough by what they're seeing to make the offer that the White Sox want, which ultimately would not get to Soto level, but would be a significant return. That's the only reason to trade him. Next question comes from Will, who asks, Hey, Ken, you mentioned that Chris Bassett could be among the starters traded at the deadline. Are there any teams that you could see being interested in him? Well, Will, this is an interesting question because there are a ton of teams that need starting pitching. And there are certain teams, certain contenders, that, in my opinion, are in a near 
desperate position with regard to their rotation. Teams that almost desperately need a starter. I'm talking about Baltimore. I'm talking about Boston, Cleveland for sure, Houston, and in the National League, Milwaukee, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and the San Diego Padres. That is a list of seven teams that I believe urgently need a starter. There are other teams as well that could use a starter. So if you're the Blue Jays, I know you're thinking about 2025 and how great you're going to be then. But you know what? The Blue Jays should be open to everything possible that they can consider at this deadline. And trading Bassett would be something that might be advantageous to them. I know their rotation is the strength of the team. And obviously, if you're going to compete next year, you want to keep that group intact. But Bassett is earning the rest of his $22 million salary this season. So he's owed about a third of that right now. And then he's going to be owed $22 million next season. Teams will be interested in him. Teams will want that kind of veteran starter. And if you're the Blue Jays, in my view, again, you have to look at anything and everything. All right, final question. This one comes from Dave Lefkin, who says or asks, is this the year to completely empty the Yankees' farm system? Peak Judge and Cole, only one guaranteed year of Soto. I feel like if they don't attack this year's window, it should be a total rebuild around Judge and Cole. Everyone else should be on the table. Okay, Dave, you're asking for some dramatic action, and I get it. The idea that they should be intense buyers is the correct one, and you're absolutely right. It revolves around what you said. Not as much the Judge Cole question, though, yes, they are in their primes right now and won't be forever, but the Soto question. You have only one guaranteed year of Juan Soto. It's this year. Now, yes, the Yankees probably are one of the favorites to sign him, but they have no idea whether they're going to be the team. Scott Boris is taking Juan Soto to the market, and he's going to try to get the best deal possible, and he doesn't care where it comes from. Doesn't have to be the New York Yankees, and Soto doesn't care either. Remember, he turned down 440 from the Nationals over 15 years. He wants maximum dollars. So you're sitting there. You're in that position. You've got to go. Aaron Judge is going to be good for several more years, I would expect. He's not going to be great forever. With Cole, yes, you can keep him beyond this year with that funky option that he has, and that'll work out fine, I'm sure. But he's getting older. He had an injury this year. So yes, this is a time not to empty the farm system necessarily, but certainly to be aggressive in addressing holes. And there's another team in a similar position, the team in their division that they're competing with for the AL East title, the Orioles. Now, they're going to be good for many years. They've got young players coming out of everywhere. But this is their one guaranteed year with Corbin Burns. And I would suggest that the Orioles stand less of a chance of signing Burns than the Yankees do of signing Soto. Now, I know some Oriole fans are saying, well, we've got a new owner. Yeah, I know you've got a new owner and he's going to spend, but Baltimore is not the same size market as New York. And Burns is represented by, guess who? Scott Boris, who again is going to seek maximum dollars for Corbin Burns. So both these teams are in positions where they need to go. They need to be aggressive. And the Yankees have multiple holes. The Orioles basically need a frontline starter and bullpen help. They've been on every reliever under the sun. Those two teams have to be aggressive, and I expect that they will be aggressive. I want to thank everyone for their questions, everyone for watching, for listening. By now, you know where to find us. YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Subscribe to us, like us. We'll be back on Thursday with our second show of the week, the one I co-host with Alana Rizzo. Have a great week, everyone. I want to let everyone know about the accessibility for online betting around the D.C. area, previously only accessible at Nationals Park. Sports fans district-wide now have access to the BetMGM mobile app, state-of-the-art sports wagering experience, plus related rewards tied to Marriott Bomboy and MGM Resorts properties nationwide, including MGM National Harbor. Yeah, baby. BetMGM.com is where you go. Must be 21 plus to wager. DC only gambling problem or concern. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.